Yesterday and today, we heard some really engaging discussions and presentations, a lot of the challenges that we're all facing um, related to staffing, related to um, the hybrid work environment. Um, and, uh, and then this, that second one actually is very intriguing because one, it, it actually challenges in some way the concept of campus, right? And in fact, you know, you have the choice to work at home or learn at home or in campus. The home option, and we talked a little bit about that, seems to be easier, but is it, but is it better? And so I'm, I'm going to make the argument that, in fact, it raises the bar on the importance of design, um, uh, campus design, uh, architectural design on the campus to actually uh, honor the, the engagement, the active engagement of people, both learning and at work. Um, I actually offer to you that perhaps five years from now, um, you might remember a couple of the presentations, right? I mean, but you will remember this place, right? And this place was actually created with an eye towards legacy and an eye towards um, quality, architectural quality. And I think that you will take that away from you. You might remember it for the rest of your life, whereas some of the presentations, um, you know, you might remember some of that too. But just to tell you a little bit about me um, and where I'm coming from, um, I was at the, U, at the GSA um, when they were developing a process called design excellence. And it was a, a, a deliberate effort to try to elevate the quality of federal architecture. Uh, and then I took a lot of those lessons with me everywhere I went to Cornell and to the University of Toronto, where I actually acted as the primary design advocate for those campuses. There are, there, I'm not, there are many others. Um, the, the, the US GSA has 11 regional offices. Each one of them has a regional chief architect, which actually is, is dedicated to actually ensuring uh, that in fact we, we build the best possible buildings that we can. The, the, bit, the most costly decision is to build. The next most important decision is to build well, to build something that actually enhances uh, the campus that's being added onto and enhances the, the academic mission. Uh, university architects, um, I, was, I was a member of the Association of University Architects. For those, those of you that are in that association, it's, it's a very valuable um, 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 group. Uh, and there's roughly, a, a, probably around 200 uh, rough, rough members throughout the U.S. that act, act as advocates for design within their university. Many with different levels of, of empowerment, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the New York City Department of Design and Construction Excellence was actually modeled after the GSA's um, um, effort, and the Chicago Department of Planning and Development. There, there are probably many more throughout the, these are, these are, these are the ones that I think are the most prominent ones. Um, so what are the qualities of a design-focused organization? And, and I think from being involved with some of them, I, 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 I kind of gathered and was able to abstract some of those, so those qualities. The first one, is that there's a clearly designated advocate. You know, what, what, when you have a pool of, of, of people with competing interest, um, in, some, in some points, design gets caught short shift, right? And uh, there are all kinds of preferences. Uh, and, and, and I think that design advocate has to be a professional, has to be someone that actually is trained in, in architecture and campus planning, understands perhaps the dialogue that, that is uh, the national and international dialogue, what are some of the evolving ideas. Uh, we, t we heard a little bit about uh, net zero, um, you know, cross-laminated timber, uh, passive house. These are all evolving technologies that are um, perhaps best understood by folks that have their, their sights set on understanding how the built environment can help support um, not, not just the academic mission, but our, our global mission. Uh, second is to be sure that it's not just the, 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 um, the predilection of, of, of just an individual. Most of these institutions also have a, a design review committee of some sort that actually bring other experts that are also trained and have these sensitivities and actually challenge and, um, and, and, and steward the design process so that it actually everything that is added onto the campus is actually an enhancement of the campus and doesn't take away from the, 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 the beauty, right? Uh, third is a philosoph oh, it's all written down here. Uh, the philosophical clarity on the value of design. I know that Cornell University had a statement uh, saying that the campus will be along way past any dean, any president, and therefore the integrity um, 
of that campus, uh, the architectural and campus planning integrity needs to be preserved. So um, whereas you know, we all understand that, that deans and presidents have, um, are, are, are very powerful individuals, there needs to be some kind of balance that actually weighs those um, interests um, against the longer term interests of, of the campus. And lastly, I would say that an open, transparent, and simple design process, one that allows designers to understand that in fact you're interested in quality design um, um, and I'll talk a little bit about how GSA actually uh, determined that. So to the right is the, uh, and, I, and I typed in ugly federal building, and that's one built like in the early 70s. And a, lot, a lot of cities have these, these buildings, and this was the status of federal architectural design uh, probably in the 1950s through the 1980s, uh, which is a shame because uh, some of the buildings built in the 30s and 20s were actually incredible buildings, and many times the most important building in town one that actually represented the, the strength and the importance of the federal government uh, within its community. Um, uh, it was a place where if you were out west, you picked up your mail from, from the east. It's where you actually um, um, joined the army, perhaps, uh, where you got naturalized and, and, and for, for, for newcomers to this country. So, um, but I think in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, it actually, architecture or the building enterprise became uh, a commodity. How many square feet can we build for how much? And that's important. Those things are very important. But I, but I would say that there are other qualities that have to be actually um, um, in, in, embraced. Um, architectural record um, actually cited the GSA Design Excellence Program as one of the more significant um, um, efforts in the 20th century in terms of elevating the quality of architecture. So those of us that were involved with that are pretty proud of that. Um, and, um, and the way that it came to be was that we did have a large uh, courthouse program that was coming our way, $10 billion in construction. And we reached out to a blue ribbon panel of, of significant architects in the country and we said, we don't want to build buildings like on the right. You know, how, do we, how do we not do that? So um, what they advised and came back say, said is like, you have to put a focus on design. Um, at that time, and, I'm not, and, and, and I know many universities also had the same selection processes, you, 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 you asked for everything. You asked for uh, submission requirements that were three or four inches thick, and basically about everything except maybe design, right? It was just kind of a, a, a nominal um, attribute towards the selection process. The, 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 we were advised that what we had to do was make it very strong and commun communicate very clearly that the importance of design was a, of, a paramount in terms of who, what we were trying to do. Many institutions use a process similar to this, but what makes this um, somewhat different is that we, tr we try to minimize the cost of admission so that creative and younger firms, perhaps, um, uh, in, in a more diverse pool of architects, can actually go after it. A 30-page submission of your past portfolio is not something that requires um, eight people in the office for to, you know, three weeks to actually produce. It's something that if, if you have a good portfolio, you can actually um, submit it and you can be successful if in fact your work is actually engaging. And how is that determined? How do we, how do we actually select and, and are confident that in fact um, that we are um, being very careful? We bring in a peer uh, into the selection process. Um, when I was with the GSA, it was normally perhaps the dean of the School of Architecture in whatever state building we were building. Um, and, um, um, you know, and at Cornell, we had uh, the dean of the School of Architecture also involved to be sure that, in fact, the voice of design um, was actually incorporated into the evaluation process. And when the, when the architect proponents understand that dynamic, it changes overnight in terms of who goes after these projects. So um, then the, the next part is the interview process. And at that point, we actually do ask for a more robust um, submission, uh, being that we don't want to have a problem in design execution. But you will find that if you find a small pool of talented architects, all the, um, all the good engineers and supporting um, people will flock to them. If you only have four or five firms, as opposed to asking 30 f firms to compose a full team, um, you will get much, a much more quality um, submission, even in the technical um, areas. So in phase one, we focus entirely on the architect and the designers, 
And then in stage two, we look at the full composite team. Um, but, but at that point, it's down to th uh, three or four. Um, and then the other part of it, to actually make sure that the design process actually stimulates and, and, and um, advocates for design is we have peer reviews. And during schematic design, we might have two peer reviews. One, one at the, when the ideas are flexible enough so they can actually incorporate um, uh, critique. And then again, afterwards, to be sure that the critique was uh, successfully uh, um, absorbed into the project. So this is a model that um, I think was successful um, in both uh, in, in all the institutions that I've been in that we've had this process um, um, implemented. Um, so why is this important for um, our, our enterprise, um, um, higher learning? And most, most campuses consist of buildings that are related, that are interconnected. They don't have to be the same architectural language, but they have to be responsive to each other. So therefore, architects that can actually address those sensitivities is vital. Sometimes we actually put a lot of emphasis on program, and that's important too. But how the, build, how, how the architects, the designers that you're looking at, has the capacity to stitch this building into the context is as important. Buildings on the university campuses are built to last. We're not developers. We don't build buildings with a 30-year return. Some, some do. I mean, you know, if you're building, let's say, um, housing or, or um, um, market rate housing at the periphery of campus, you might be building for a return on investment. But in the core campus, you're actually hopefully building for something that is built to last. Uh, campus beauty is important to students. When I was at Cornell, we used to think that, boy, this place better be nice because who would want to come to the middle of nowhere to <laughs> spend four years or, or six years? And um, um, so, I mean, granted, it was blessed with a, a being in a beautiful place, but, but the buildings had to, in some ways, also enhance that place. And then lastly, I would say that the university experience is something where young students or young, young citizens in training um, actually are, become aware of hopefully more things beyond just their discipline. And the fact that, in fact, um, 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 the value of, of the arts, the value of architecture, the value of campus planning, are things that they can take back with them when they enter um, um, their communities. I showed you the ugly federal building, and these were a result of some of the buildings that came out of the Design Excellence Program. Um, the, the one on the left by Richard Meyer and the Islip Federal Courthouse. To the right, Morphosis, the U Eugene, Oregon uh, Federal Courthouse. And now I'm, I'm going to show you some examples of, of work that was done um, within, the, within the framework of that um, architectural evaluation process. Uh, Cornell University to the left, the Dairy Teaching Barn. We were actually pickled. We were just tickled that that in fact um, this this building made the cover of Architectural Record Magazine and American Farmer Magazine at the same time, uh, and uh, and it was a, a a dairy barn for cows. But we selected Ernie McHenry out of Philadelphia, and they actually did a fantastic job. Uh, to the right, uh, Gates Hall by Morphosis, um, a building that we built. At, this was in two thousand and five dollars. Uh, $450 a square foot. So it shows that, in fact, you can have innovative and thought-provoking design um, um, on budget and, um, and, um, um, and, and pleasing the bottom line. Um, the Plantations Welcome Center by a Canadian architect, Baird Sampson and Newart, and to the right, Milstein Hall um, by um, OMA and, and uh, Ribbon Coolhouse. And Fred Coder, uh, Coder Kim and Associates, um, the, in addition to a historic building, showing that in fact you don't need to be um, a mimic of, of, of a contextual building, that in fact by being bold you can actually enhance both of them. And um, um, Paul Goldberger, who was a critic for the New York Times, actually said that this building was, it, it, the, the glass enshrined in some ways the historic building in a way that made it look even more precious than it was before. And also uh, at Cornell, the, um, the uh, veterinarian school, it was a renovation. This is, this is a, a combination of buildings that were built from the 1940s to around the 1970s, and it was basically uh, a maze of, of programmatic uh, connections. And basically what we did was we, we tried to find a focus 
and open up um, 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 uh, an area of the building to create a sense of orientation and a, and a sense of being. Um, uh, be that the vet school was something that was open almost 24 hours a day and many, many students just basically stayed there for very long periods of time. I was lucky enough to be involved with the um, Roosevelt Island uh, development. Uh, uh, for those of you that might know about it, was the City of New York was looking for a academic partner to help uh, commercialize um, 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 Applied Sciences, um, the, the uh, you know, and uh, we won that competition, and um, and uh, we actually had set for ourselves um, uh, a, a, a bar in terms of we were going to be a highly sustainable campus. So to the right is the um, um, the Bloomberg Building, um, which is net zero. Um, it has a large um, photovoltaic canopy above it. Also has a full, um, geothermal wells. Um, and uh, we, we, we built it um, to be net zero. The tall building you see in the center is the largest passive house building in the world. Um, when, at least when it was done, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it might still be, but it has 500 beds um, and being passive house, for those of you that know about that technology, it uses about 80% less energy than an orthodox building. So again, bringing these ideas to the table um, is something that um, is, is a design decision, right? I mean, if, if you basically just say, well, we need 500 beds for students, there's two ways to approach it, right? One is a commodity and one is something like, well, can we actually be more thoughtful about this? At the University of Toronto, uh, the Diller Scafidio Renfro, um, the uh, Center for Civilizations and Cities, um, um, right next to the Royal Ontario Museum, um, which is also, also a very um, significant building. Um, and then also the University of Toronto, um, uh, what at that time was the tallest cross-laminated timber building. And for those of you that are aware of this technology, it's, it's, um, and, and we were trying at that time to move the building code, which at that time was only a seven to eight story limit on wood frame buildings. So this is, this is a technology called cross-laminated timber. Wood using much less carbon than, or emitting much less carbon than steel and concrete. For those of you that know how steel and concrete are produced, it requires vast amounts of heat, uh, and they're heavy materials, and they have to be transported. Uh, cross lum um, lumber is something that is native to Canada, um, and actually what uh, material that um, sequestered uh, carbon as it was growing, um, and is is, is a is, is a renewable um, material. So, just to summarize. I think that um, owner design advocacy is vital to facilitate the possibility of great architectures um, and um, promote a wider demand for thoughtful architecture by other builders. I will say that um, when we started um, doing our cross-laminated timber building in, in Toronto, all of a sudden other ones started cropping up throughout the city. So I think that in many ways, universities and government actually are in some ways um, bleeding edge adopters and that uh, sometimes that they help actually stimulate um, the thinking that could occur in other um, enterprises. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much.